have Dr. Rudolph Daniels with us tonight. He's an assistant dean and department chair of Railroad Operations Technology and instructor of Railroad History at Western Iowa Tech Community College in Sioux City. Rudy likes to travel throughout the state, a definite perk of being a humanities board speaker. He reported quite a battle with the wind on his drive across Iowa yesterday. Dr. Daniels has written the official history of U.S. railroads, trains across the continent, and we are very pleased to have that book available for sale tonight on the front at our gift shop. Rudy will also return to Ames on August 21st for one of those gallery talks I mentioned. He's going to be speaking about the railway post office. <clears throat> this is something that uh, many of us remember, but of course it's gone now. And uh, he's really excited to delve into the subject and talk more about it. Again, our Rail Reality Exhibition opens June 1st and runs through the end of October. And now, please welcome Dr. Rudy Daniels. All aboard the corn king, the corn king, Chicago Northwestern Streamline to Points West, to Points West. Leaving Northwestern Station, Chicago. Northwestern Station, Chicago. Track two, track two. The Corn King, the Corn King. Coaches up front, coaches up front. Dining car, dining car. Two, that is, two special power cars for the Ames Historical Society. Two special power cars for the Ames Historical Society. Pullman to the rear, Pullman to the rear. Major station stops, Clinton, Clinton. Cedar Rapids, Cedar Rapids, Ames. Ames, Carol Dennison, Missouri Valley, Missouri Valley, Ottawa, Sergeant Bluff, and Sioux City. Corn King, Corn King, all aboard, all aboard. Shrek 2, the Corn King, all aboard. Thank you. Before I begin, would it be okay if I took my hat off? <laughs> if the glare gets too much, <laughs> I'll put it back on, okay? I can start off with a question. How many of you think, I'm sure by raising your hands, that Iowa was critical or critically important for the growth of our nation's railroads? Okay, very good. Very good. Well, this is how we'll proceed tonight. You have a uh, bit of music with you, right? Some songs. We're going to start off with a sing along, and then I want you to tell me. Oh, we can go maybe four or five significant train stories you can tell me and share with everyone. Okay? Then I'll begin the program and we'll talk about the, really how the railroads got to Iowa and then what happened when the railroads got here. And we'll talk about some Iowa firsts. And from the Iowa first, we'll go and talk about some of the great trains, some of the greatest trains in the world came through and stopped in Iowa. And then uh, just a very short sketch on what, what's going on today, which of course is uh, for the most part freight, freight service. We only have one Amtrak train uh, in California Zephyr. Well, no, we actually do. California Zephyr and the, uh, and the chief comes to Iowa from the old Santa Fe line. Okay? So why don't we begin by singing, I've been working on the river. Don't forget, I'm a conductor. <laughs> okay? And when we get to uh, that last the fee five fifty nine oh why don't we hold that all out before we're strumming on the old banjo and when we get the dino won't you blow your horn why don't we speed it up a bit okay all right all set are you ready we'll do alarm as well all right a one and two and a I've been working on the railroad all the new long day Thank you. 
Uh, maybe a train story that you remember or something significant in the train for you. I'll tell you the train story. Somebody? Yes, yes, sir. St. Louis Museum of Transportation, he visited, and they have lots of trains, steam locomotives, whole bit, whole layout, whole yards, full of different trains. Well, I grew up in the Tumwa, and my mother and I would take the Zephyr into Chicago early in the morning, shop all day, have lunch at Marshall Fields, and take the late, late train back at night, have dinner in the diner, and be back in the Tumwa by 10.30 at night. So I mean, a wonderful day of shopping and fun in a big city. Great, that's great. Now, was, did you take the Amtrak Zephyr or the Chicago Road? No, this is it. back in the 40s and 50s. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Wow, the real thing, you probably remember the Zephyrettes. Yeah. 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 I'm going to love one of the trains. Well, my, I, I have one. My dad worked for the Chicago Northwestern, and so when I was 13, I took the train by myself to go to California to visit my cousins. Oh, wow. That's tremendous. I was from Council Bluffs originally, railroad center, of course, came to Iowa State College, and I used to ride the train home, leave here at 10 o'clock and get home at midnight on the UV back in the early 50s. Oh, okay. Okay, very good. Maybe one more train story? Yes, sir. My dad uh, dragging us out of bed in 1938 to go down to the 6th Street Viaduct to watch the three mile block. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really something that we do remember train stories and the times we rode the train. It's just really magnificent. Okay, now I'd like to talk about how the trains came to Iowa and then what happened when they got here, the railroad got here. Basically, the railroad started on the East Coast, in the major cities of the East Coast, the first one being Baltimore, and then Charleston had trains, and then uh, New York and Boston. And the idea was to uh, uh, lay the tracks into the interior so that the farmers could get their products through the large cities on the East Coast, thereby feeding the people in the city. At the same time, the farmers could make money on the produce uh, that they sent, or, or cows that they sent to uh, the largest, larger cities. Well, once they got across the Allegheny Mountains, the idea was, OK, why don't we expand into the Mississippi River? And there was almost a race on the part of many railroads to get to Chicago or to get to St. Louis to expand it after Chicago to get to the Mississippi. But expanding the Mississippi was a problem. And the problem was, was made worse in a sense because you had this fantastic dark soil in Iowa that was excellent for farming. And my point is, if we could only get people to move and farm that fantastically great dark soil, my goodness, what a great nation we would have in producing food, not just, not just for the cities of the East Coast, but living in the whole world. So the problem then was to get the trains across the Mississippi River. By the time of the Civil War, by 1860, railroad companies had constructed about 600, a little over 600 miles of rails in, in Iowa, chiefly coming out of Burlington, coming out of Clinton, Iowa, and coming out of, of uh, Dubuque at, at that time. And they were able to penetrate a bit into the state, and then also to put some uh, other lines outward down to Keokuk and so forth. They were able to do that just before the Civil War. And obviously, the Civil War interrupted so, so many things, let alone the of construction in Iowa. But just before the Civil War, in 1856, the Iowa legislature was able to get a federal grant, uh, not just money, but abuse of land from the federal government. And what the state of Iowa did this, they said, OK, railroad companies, we want you to build across our state. Now, understand, if you're a railroad company, you're scratching your head. Do we build where there aren't anybody to serve? We're going to go out of business real fast. Soon as we put down the mail. So the state said, okay, no we'll do for you. We will help you build across the state if you are able to, to build 
75 miles in the first five years of building. And then after that, 50 miles for each additional three years. So we'll fund that, we'll help fund that for you. We said, okay, then you're gonna to have to make sure there's no uh, encumbrances on the land. In other words, whatever land you build on, you have to make sure that that title is free and clear. And then they said, if you want this money, you have to build at a gauge of four foot eight and a half inches. That is the distance between the two rails. So if you want money across the state, you're going to have to build your dead flat gauge four foot eight and a half inches. Last but not least, and this is most understandable, the state of Iowa State Railroads, well, look, you have to send us a report of your activities and your finances every year. That makes sense. I mean, they're using the money funded for that, so they should report to the state on you know, their activities and how they did. Well, the railroad started to build across Iowa. It kind of went in spurts, if you will. They would build so much, and then they had financial difficulty to go back up, form a new company, then build further, then go further across the state. And it goes, it goes something like this. If you think in terms of a ladder, and, the, and if we go from north to south, in the northernmost part of the state, you can go from McGregor over to Sheldon. And that, that's really uh, not, not too far from the, uh, from the Minnesota border we're talking about at this point. Uh, the uh, Milwaukee Road built a line across the state of Iowa. Then it did, did south from that, from the Butte to Sioux City, the Illinois Central built their line. So you see, so we're coming like a ladder. See what's going on here? And then below that, from like Savannah, Illinois, across the state, the Milwaukee Road built a second line. Milwaukee Road had two lines all the way across Iowa. And then from there, a little bit under that, was our Chicago Northwestern line, the current Union Pacific line, that comes through, through Ames, and that, that would be um, the entrance at Clinton, Iowa, to Council Bluffs. And then below that, the Chicago Rock Island Pacific, from Davenport, Iowa, through Iowa City, Des Moines, and again to Council Bluffs. And then uh, below that, we have the, the uh, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, which at that time was known as the Burlington and Missouri Valley Railroad, from Burlington, Iowa, across the state. So you see we have these ladders. And they built the building across the state. And the object was to get the Council Bluffs, because that was the connection with the, the first transcontinental railroad, the Union Pacific. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you a little secret about Union Pacific. I'll show you my shirt. I have a Union Pacific shirt. Remember, it has like a shield, right? And then a red and white stripes with the blue on the top. Doesn't that remind you of something? This is how it happened. This is how it happened. Just before the Civil War, the United States government sent explorers out to find a way to build a train to California. The person in charge of that was Jefferson Davis. Yeah, the future president of the Confederacy. And one of Lincoln's first things he did with the Civil War raging was to pass what was called the Pacific Railroad Act. And that is the money and appropriations to go to the railroad from Omaha to Sacramento and then San Francisco. Well, here you have the Civil War raging, and this new railroad to be constructed. They say, well, it shouldn't be just the Pacific Railroad, it should be the Union Pacific Railroad. The Union Pacific Railroad. So you see how Union Pacific got its name, not only that, how they have something like the American flag as a, as a symbol. Interesting, isn't it? So now you have these, all these trains trying to get to Omaha to connect with Union Pacific. And that is critical that we're going to see for a number of reasons. Okay, first I'd like to talk about some Iowa firsts, okay? Um, remember years ago when the freight train would come through Ames or any place? You remember that last car on a freight train? <laughs> what is always so magic about that last car? And don't tell me the train is gone. <laughs> what was magic about that last car? Uh, huh? Remember this? Yeah, there was a guy in the caboose and he went back. And what did he wait from? What was that called that he waved from? Either the cube wall or the bay window. 
Right, exactly, exactly. You hear the gentleman? Cubicle or bay window? It's a cubicle on top, bay windows on the side. Well, the cubicle was invented in Alabama. The caboose itself was invented on a railroad that became part of New York Central in, in lower New York State. And what happened is, on a passenger train, we conductors, we know we can always find a place to sit and work for our records. But where does a conductor sit on a freight train? Over the cupboard? Could be. So this one conductor in New York got the idea of having an extra box car put at the end of the train he had the people in the shop cut a hole in the top of the car and then put in a ladder. So he would climb up the ladder, every once in a while, look over the train. And he was looking over for certain things. One is what they call a hot box. And that is your bearing was getting hot and they would, they would stuff it with a wool rag, wool cloth, so it would make a blue smoke when it got too hot and they wouldn't stop the train and that car was in bad shape. Okay? That was preventing the rail. So the conductor always had to look out, and then later on, the conductor would check the air pressure and the brakes. And you know, this is very nice in, let's say, Louisiana or South Carolina, that roll on top of a car and climb up and look out. But it's not good in January in Iowa. <laughs> so there is a conductor on the Chicago Northwestern Line, on this line here, who got the idea that let's take this car with its hole in into the shop. It's a good idea to begin with. And why don't we put kind of like a shack above that and put that shack with glass? Therefore, hey, I can look out over the entire train and not worry about snow, and not worry about sleet or rain or even the hot sun on a summer day. The caboose, the cupola, and eventually the bay window were invented here right in Iowa, right on the tracks within several hundred feet of where we were sitting. Now, if that isn't something, it would say Dodge from Fort Dodge, a farmer from Fort Dodge. His name was Lorenzo Coffin. And Lorenzo Coffin, during the Civil War, was kind of like a minister, but then he, after the Civil War, went back to farming, and he was going to go to Illinois Central out of Fort Dodge to Chicago. And he was watching some railroad men coupling a car together. Now, back then, they had a link, like a chain, and they had a pin. And you had to put links together from one car to the other and then put it down the pin. And you could not find a brakeman who, who had all his fingers because of all the accidents. And sometimes the trains would come together too quickly and actually crush the man and kill him. And this man, Lorenzo, called and said, You know, during the Civil War, I remember some guy by the name of Jamie who invented an automatic coupler that you don't have to stand there and lose your fingers. You sit, stand on the outside of the car when the car is coming so you don't get hurt. Lorenzo Coffin became the first Iowa Commissioner of Railroads. And he got worked through Iowa, he worked with the legislature, and he worked to get this J.D. Coupler adopted on most railroads. And then he did something else. He heard that this guy by the name of Westinghouse invented an air brake. And he said, okay, I'm going to have Westinghouse come to Iowa. And we're going to test his invention right here in Iowa. So Lorenzo Coffin had him bring his invention, his ideas, to that hill just outside of Burlington. Have you ever been to the Burlington? They have this huge hill that goes down from the Mississippi River. Well, they tested his air brake, and it worked there, and Lorenzo Coffin fought to have that air brake installed on all trains. In 1893, the federal government took Lorenzo Coffin's ideas, created the Railroad Safety Appliance Act. In doing so, they cut down railroad accidents by 60% by using the Cheney coupler, coupler and the Westinghouse airbase. 60%. They've been in conductors go home now with hands for that. Because to do brakes on the train at that time, they had to climb up onto the top of the car and turn the wheel. Again, that's okay in May, but not in January when you fall off the train. So those are the things that Lorenzo Coffin was able to say. Another thing that's first in Iowa had to do with the control of railroad rates. Uh, you've probably heard of the Grange Organization of Farmers in the Midwest in the 
19th century. Well, 60% of the granges were in Iowa. And farmers by the 18, late 1870s, 1880s, were realizing, that, hey, wait a minute. And excuse me, they always talk in terms of pigs, OK? So excuse me with this. We have to say hogs in this case. That it was cheaper to send a hog 500 miles than it was to send a hog 50 miles. Say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Well, yes, it does. Because if you lived in a city that had two or three railroads in it, they kept their prices low because they competed sending that hog over a long distance. But if you came from a one railroad town, a one railroad town, and that railroad made up that difference by charging that short, that shorter distance that the hog went. Thereby, the farmers of Iowa got together and through the state legislature, and then with the representatives in Congress, they created, the farmers in Iowa created the Interstate Commerce Commission, which regulated railroad rates, railroad rates until the 1960s. This is incredible. All done by the people of Iowa. Say, so now we're talking about the people of Iowa. I mean, if you don't mind, I'm going to treat a little bit and read some numbers to you. This is not the chicken and the egg, OK? This is not the chicken and the egg. This is railroad and the people. Railroad and the people. Here's the deal. Before the coming of the railroads, what happened was farmers would only live along navigable rivers to get their produce to market. That's all. So the whole interior of the state, including names, could not be populated with profitable farming. And as the railroads came, so did the people. This is the original, if we build it, they will come. Just to give you an idea, remember we said there were 600 plus miles of railroad just before the Civil War. Iowa had, Iowa had a population of 640,000. In 10 years, we had 2,700 miles of railroads. And our population grew to 1 million, uh, about 200,000. 1880, we almost doubled that, 4,400 miles of railroads. And our population grew to 1,600,000. 1890, almost doubled that again, 8,300 miles of railroads. Population, almost 2 million. In 1911, we had 10,500 miles of railroads. Population, about 2 and a quarter million. What does this mean? Every community that grew in Iowa during that time was located in 15 miles of a railroad depot. There was such a spider web of tracks in the state of Iowa just before World War I that you could take someone, spin them around four or five times just for the fun of it, point them in any direction, and say, start walking, and within 11 miles, they would come to a railroad track. I was densely populated with rail miners, and that's what made us a great farming state, because people could move here, farm, and send their produce to the large markets on the east and west coasts to make Iowa a prosperous state. Absolutely amazing. If we had the first of railroads, we had something else that we could be very proud of. We had the biggest crooks in the railroad history. <laughs> Let me ask you, who was the most notorious outlaw of all times? Jesse James. Right, yeah. And Jesse James got his reputation right here in Iowa. That's right. In 1873, he heard that a Rock Island train was coming through with lots of money. So he got his band of boys together, and just outside of a small town uh, along the Rock Island line, just uh, southwest of here, what they did was they pulled some tracks away, <laughs> some rails out, they pulled some rails out on a curve, and they decided, well, it's still early, uh, we're waiting for the train, we're getting kind of hungry. So they went into town. And they saw these pies on a pork shelf. 
back then we used to let the pies that they baked be cool off on a cold shelf. And the boys went and helped themselves to all those pies and then went back and got the train. And that was the first major train robbery in the United States. It was called the heist for around the world. Now the Rock Island was embarrassed beyond belief of this. They were embarrassed that they could not believe. So they went and hired this guy by the name of Alan Pinkerton. And he brought it up and he said, you look, you've got to find out who this guy was and what he did. Alan Pinkerton they chose because his symbol was the eye that never sleeps. And that's the origin of the term private eye. On top of that, for any police officers in the audience, the descriptions that Pinkerton used are still used today to des describe a suspect. So that was created also with the Jesse James Radio. Wow, we can be really proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> but the biggest legal problem was called the eye of a pool. No, it's not someplace you go swim. No, no, no. Pooling is how railroads arrange their, their schedules so they can make more money and do away with competition. Remember we said all those railroads kind of met in council bluffs? Well, they all came out of Chicago. They were all competing, competing for transcontinental traffic out of Chicago. And they said, this is crazy. We're competing with ourselves that we're keeping our rates so low and not making that much money. So they got the idea of this to do a pool. They said, OK, one week, Illinois Central will handle all the transcontinental cargo. All the other railroads would handle cargo between Chicago and Council Bluffs, but they wouldn't transport anything more transcontinental. So therefore, the Illinois Central made all that money that week. And then after that, the Chicago Building Committee would see what happened next week. And then the third week after, the Chicago Northwestern would have their, have their way, would have their, their thing. And then the Milwaukee Road. And this went on and on and on for several years. Until finally, the Iowans through the Interstate Commerce Commission put an end to the Iowa pool. The pool. This one was considered the most, most horrible breach of capitalism ever in the United States. And it happened right here in Iowa. <laughs> Very proud, proud of that. So we have a number of important Iowa firsts. I'd like now to turn to um, some of the great trains that came from Iowa. And someone mentioned that traveling on the uh, Chicago Board of Quincy Zephyr in one time. That, that was one. Uh, Chicago Board Quincy Zephyr, California Zephyr, uh, traveling from of course, Chicago to California. Uh, in fact, they were the ones who invented the Vista Dome cars, with the Dome cars. They were the first ones to invent those cars. They had, they had the hostesses on the trains called Zephyrettes, and the slogan was a pillow on every seat, for every seat that they had By the way, CB and Q featured poultry in their dining car because they had their own poultry farms. So their own, they raised their own turkey, duck, and chicken. Uh, Rock Island, oh my goodness, the famous Rock Island Rockets, the Golden State, uh, Rocky Mountain Rocket came through Iowa. These were absolutely first class trains linked to make, make connections for uh, California. And then, of course, Chicago Northwestern uh, coming through Iowa. Chicago Northwestern, of course, pulled the quarantine, which I use as an introduction, but for a while it pulled the famous Union Pacific trains. The city of Los Angeles, the city of San Francisco, the Portland Rose, these great trains. And by the way, the Chicago Northwestern was noted for its famous steaks and pot roasts for dinner in their diner. In Illinois Central, Creole food, of course, all their Creole cooking. Illinois Central, they, they had the land, then the corn, they had uh, the Hawkeye that came through Iowa, in Chicago, in the Sioux City. And my goodness, the Milwaukee Road and their streamliners pulled by the famous high office as they cruised across Iowa, cruised at 110 miles an hour. You want to test uh, venison, and, uh, but that kind of, that kind of uh, fare for, for dinner, you went on the Milwaukee Road. The Midwest high office came here with connections to the Pacific Northwest. All these great trains came from Iowa. 
some of the greatest trains, some of the fastest trains in the world came through our state. And this is not to forget the Wabash that came to Council Bluffs, or that little bit 17 miles that the Santa Fe came through uh, uh, Southeast Island and the Keokai, that, that area. And of course, the uh, Santa Fe was known for, famous for its lobster, and later its double-decker de double cars. All these great trains came through. Well, we no longer have the passenger service today. It's not like it was 50, 60 years ago. But we have still some great railroads in Iowa. Currently, we have uh, a bit over 4,000 miles of track from that high number back in 1911, far cry from that. Many of the branch lines have been take, taken up, uh, unfortunately. But uh, we have Union Pacific, which is the largest holder of rail in Iowa. With Chicago Burn, the old Chicago Burn, Burn New Quincy is now known as just BNSF, which is used initially in the main, uh, second largest number of track miles. And the third, the Norfolk Southern has trackage rights to, um, to Des Moines. So they have trackage rights to Des Moines, the third largest company. We have a, a bit over 15 smaller railroads in the state of Iowa. Some have just a couple, couple of miles, a couple of miles of track. So things have changed since then. But I want you to think, the way the railroads were built across our continent, just to throw out a couple of names, the Great Northern, Northern Pacific, Western Pacific, Union Pacific, Southern Pacific, Santa Fe, that's the same way that the trains cross an island, like a great ladder, if you will. But there's something else, too. As Iowa goes, so goes the nation. Remember that four foot, eight and a half inch gauge? Well, before Iowa, there were all kinds of gauges and tracks before the Civil War, before construction tracks came. You had the Erie Railroad had a six foot gauge. Five foot gauge was kind of popular in the South. There was an Ohio gauge of four foot, ten inches. The Pennsylvania had a four foot, nine inches. All these kind of gauges. And they were originally built that way, they argued, so that another railroad shouldn't put their cars on another railroad. That way, you had to use the railroad cars of the railroad that you would be riding on. You can't interchange cars from one railroad company to another. You couldn't do that. <laughs> Except in that Pacific Railroad Act, we talked about with Abraham Lincoln. In that act of Congress, it gave the president the right to choose the gauge of the transcontinental railroad. And everybody knew that whatever the gauge of that transcontinental railroad, railroad would be, that Lincoln would set, would eventually become a standard gauge of the nation. Lincoln originally stated the gauge to be five foot which would kind of sort of favor the railroads of the defeated Confederacy. Well, the presidents of the Pennsylvania and the one from Ohio had to live with Lincoln. Pennsylvania was four foot nine, both from Ohio was four foot eight and a half, and said, really, this four foot eight and a half would be better. Of course, Lincoln's thinking about it. And then he realized something. If you have five foot gauge standard for the transcontinental railroad, your railroads, due to Iowa's legislation of four foot eight and a half, you'd have to change things from one car to another in Omaha. Geez, if we just made it four foot eight and a half inches, as Iowa gauge is, in building the transcontinental, you could put something on in California, in Chicago, and it could get all the way to California without changing cars. And by the 1880s, railroads all got together, and most of them standardized their track to the Iowa gauge of four foot eight and a half inches. As Iowa goes, so went the nation. <laughs> Why don't you ask me again, how many of you think that Iowa has an important place in the development of the nation's railroads? <coughs> Great. Thank you very much. And
going to open it up for questions or comments, Jeff. And we can, we can talk about uh, railroads in Iowa, but if you want to expand it, railroads in general, questions about railroads in general, I'll, be, I'll do my best to answer them, okay? This gentleman here has a question. What about north south railroads and the narrow gauges and the inner urbans? Right, okay. Um, I'm not going to, uh, there, there are narrow gauge railroads throughout the United States. Um, they were built at different gauges. In fact, Iowa had 21 narrow gauge railroads at, at one time. Uh, narrow gauge railroads were built uh, uh, mostly to, they were cheaper to build, number one. The other thing is they could easily be built around curvaceous or mountainous terrain. And uh, for example, Colorado had a number of narrow gauges due to the mining industry there. Iowa had some narrow gauges, 21 of them actually built to uh, get to the smaller communities to bring uh, the goods to a larger railhead to put on a stand, standard gauge uh, railroad. Uh, almost all, well, Denver and Rio Grande went to standard gauge, actually two gauges, they had a narrow gauge, it tracks within standard gauge uh, by, the, by the 1930s, so um, even if they went standard gauge at the time. The interurbans, a lot of them were built at four foot eight and a half inches. An interurban was, uh, a kind of usually an electric train, usually electric, that went between one city and another. Uh, one of the most famous was between Chicago and St. Louis that actually had berths that you could see, believe it or not. The uh, Fort Dodge Des Moines Southern is often considered, was considered interurban inter inter between uh, Fort Dodge and Des Moines. If you know, those were called interurban, they mostly all, all passenger. There were lighter rail, uh, usually operated, usually operated by electricity. So that's what he meant by the gentleman meant by the Yes, sir. One thing you're mentioning cabooses. Yes. On the Northwestern, you don't dare call it a caboose. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> they call it a late car. Right. Uh, I'm using the generic term. Um, a lot of Western railroads call them drovers cars. Also called drovers cars because when a farmer would take his cattle to market, the farmer would be a cattle farmer was a drover. So he would sleep in the caboose, that's his cattle went to market, and then he'd ride in the caboose to go back home. The Pennsylvania Railroad called them cabin cars. So they were known in different railroads by different names. The caboose is the generic, generic term. Mr. Could you tell us the story of Oaks Ames, how the namesake for Iowa. He played the part in the railroads, and I thought maybe he would be one of the biggest crooks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's true. I, I don't know enough detail about the story of Old Sames, although he made a lot of money with the Union Pacific, incredibly, incredibly so. And uh, supposedly at the time that they joined the rails east and west, that uh, he was made quite Call of jokes, let me put it that way at, at that time. You know, you know, shovels. In fact, there still is a name shovel company today. I don't know whether it's still in the family or not. Yes, ma'am. But Oak Sames never set foot in the He was the town was named by John Hensley Blair, who was a friend of Oak Sames and named it in his honor. Right, and Blair was one of the big railroad developers of a number of railroads. With Pennsylvania, and then he did a bit with Lower Central and then the Milwaukee Road. Yes? Yeah, would you explain uh, why the Northwestern uh, adopted the left hand? Uh, okay, this question is why did the Chicago and Northwestern adopt the right on the, to the, on the left rather than on the right? Yeah, um, what happened was this the, the uh, Chicago and Northwestern started out as what was called the Chicago and Union Railroad Company. And they went to the Northwest out of Chicago. That's how they got their, their name. And what happened was, uh, it, was it was like a commuter line for a while. And uh, what they did was they constructed the stations where people would, would uh, meet, if you will, on, on the um, Let's see, they constructed the station where people would be on the left, uh, the north side of the tracks. So they would run, uh, and they would run out of 
of their origin coming from Galena or someplace like that that would come through. They would pick up their passengers who were on the left hand side because of the wind and shelter that the station gave them. So that's how they ran, ran on the left hand side of the tracks rather than the right many years. Well, to the end, to the end. And part of the Pacific, then they went to the right. It's a good question, yeah. I was asked that ask question at a national conference about 12 years ago. Yes, sir. Yes, I heard that in the 1800s, the Supreme Court determined that the railways have the right of way at a level crossing. Can you comment on that? Well, yeah, and that actually precedes, that precedes the 1880s. That, that goes back to the, actually, to the early 1840s and the first railway horse carriage with an accident, in an accident, or an incident, I guess I should say. But it's, 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 and there's a problem. The law on this is ancient, okay? Uh, it's simply this. Trains belong on tracks, not cars. Okay? And the tracks are railroad. I'm making this as simple as I can. <laughs> tracks are railroad property. Okay? So the tracks were there first, and then came the roads. Okay. If you look at a cross spot, next time you come to, to a railroad track, you see a cross spot, that cross. If you notice, rail and road are separated by crossing. Notice that. Rail and road are separated by, by crossing. And that's because it's railroad property and the trains run on the tracks, not cars. Yeah, good question. In fact, the legal thing of that really gets thousands of pages of arguments and legal arguments for that. Uh, and actually, uh, um, the train does not hit a car, a car hits a train. Because a car's not supposed to be on the trains. <laughs> yes, sir. You know what year was considered the peak of railroad activity and what they used to define that peak? Okay, it depends on what you're looking at when you're talking about. The gentleman asked what year was the peak of railroad activity. Uh, there's two ways to look at this, okay? One is if you talk about when did you have the most mileage of track in the United States. And that was 1914, when we had over 240,000 miles of track. So as far as track is concerned, it was 1914. If you talk about what they call passenger miles, that is the most number of people who rode as passengers and most tonnage of freight on the railroad, given the population at the time, it was during World War II, 1944. Okay? So talk about people and freight per population, it would have been 1944. Talking about track miles, it was 19, 1914. Okay? Someone? Yeah, we'll okay. I wonder how many here remember the coal train wreck down on Grand Avenue. Okay, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I counted uh, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I counted fifteen hands. Yeah, just, just. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find out along the Y. I've got some great cars down there, but I didn't know that. <laughs> Someone else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's been, there has been much, much discussion, but no outlay of there have been some plans made, but no outlay of funds to have. Uh, it's not high speed rail. We're not talking about 180 miles an hour. Okay, we're talking about trains that would go about 110 miles an hour. 
that would go from Chicago to Council Bluffs and Omaha. There's been discussion, there's been some in-court planning, of what is the feasibility, can we do this? To understand that you'd have to change all the signals, you'd have to change, you'd, you'd have to put higher, higher uh, uh, tonnage rail, higher pound rail in certain areas to do things like that. Uh, but there's been no uh, go ahead that this is going to be done at this time. Okay. That's, that's the last I heard about it. It's, it's kind of an irony though, uh, because in the 1930s, in the walking road, their, their, uh, their Hiawatha out there to uh, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, went into the Wisconsin Delta at a cruising speed of 117 miles an hour. And that was with the steam engine. Uh, yeah. So the I mean, trains went that fast as well. And you know, today the FRA speed limit is 80 miles an hour, with some exception, with some other kind of exceptions. Uh, so the trains are the passenger trains today are not going as fast as they did as they did years ago on joint rail, not even all the rail. So we have to see what's going to happen. There's also a group in Nebraska that wants to see another a group train and track expand uh, another or put another route to Nebraska. But, uh, Nebraska legislature is very much not in favor and I don't know why. Or Senate, I should say. I don't know why. But there's been discussion, there's been talk about the uh, other uh, funds and you no know, go ahead and do it. There is by the way, there is some discussion about Chicago and St. Louis increasing speeds to 110 miles on. Yes. It, it seems to me, I'm not sure I remember this quite right, but there was an uh, emphasis put on transporting large quantities of good, goods in semi-trailers on the railroad car. I haven't seen a lot of that, and I just wondered what you came to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there was a company in Indiana that made, made those type of trailers. <clears throat> Amtrak uses them on certain routes. Believe it or not, they, they use them on certain routes, usually uh, for United Parcel Service. They use them on, on certain routes. Uh, that is an interesting uh, concept because it was actually started by the Pennsylvania Railroad in, in the uh, late 50s or the 60s. And the Interstate Commerce Commission really came down on them. Uh, with all kinds of regulations that were just a farce. I mean, they, they wanted to have markers on the thing, and on and on and on and on. They wanted to treat it as if it were a boxcar, which it wasn't. Uh, but there was, there was quite a bit of experimentation with it all. Uh, again, in the 1980s, but there is some use of them uh, by Amtrak. Uh, of course, you do have your trailers that are put on flat cars, you know, a special flat car, and are taken across the country called the land bridge, and you know, they come right from here on the Union Pacific. That's called the land bridge, so we do do that. But that, uh, that trailer train thing never really caught on. It's a shame. It really is a shame. <coughs> yes, ma'am? You mentioned uh, the high number of passengers during World War II, and there were certainly a lot of very famous chapters of things happened uh, during World War II. The railroads were run by the railroad companies. It was not the case during World War I. But would you talk a little bit about the, the federalization of the railroads and some of the outcomes? Kathy, the check is in the mail to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm writing a book right now on the railroads of World War I. Uh, she's asking something that is a period of history that uh, has not been dealt with since the 1920s. What happened was this, and I'll try to be as brief as I can do, because I could go on for days with this. Uh, during World War I, it was really the first mass, creation of a mass fighting machine in the United States since, since the Civil War, except the technology of fighting changed immensely. The type of fighting changed immensely since the Civil War. My good goodness, we had cannons that could shoot accurate, accurately 24 miles with a 1,400 pound artillery shell. So no one was talking about a cannonball, but an artillery shell explodes. Okay, so things changed immensely. 
It was a war of industrialization. Industry was to play a huge role, no longer the, the nice sharpshooter who learned how to shoot well, shooting coons behind the bar and all that kind of thing. So, you know, just, just things have changed so much. What happened was this. We got into the war in April of 1970, and we had to ship men, food, and material to France. And we had to do this. What happened was we had problems with East Coast <coughs> ports to do this. And, and what happened was we were shipping goods to ports on the East Coast that did not have rail yards yet. In fact, they said to me, uh, to shippers in the Army and the Navy, hey, if you want something to go special, here's a priority card to put on the train. It was at one point that 90% of all trains had priority cards. <laughs> you realize that from the port of New York, trains were backed up to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The congestion was so bad. And one of the big reasons for it, go back to the Iowa pool. Remember we talked about the Iowa pool? It's because in order to have to move all those men, all that food, all those artillery shells, all the material, they wanted to have the railroads function as one great big unit, not individual companies. And all the laws passed up to that point were to create competition and to prevent them from acting as if they were one big company. We prevent that from happening. The only way you can create one great big railroad system was to have the federal government take it over, and therefore the federal government did not have to obey its own anti-monopoly laws. And thereby they were able to regulate who got directly, who got these priority cards. They were able to take trains over the shortest route, or, and they were able to interchange locomotives from one railroad to another. In other words, without disobeying, without violating the monopoly laws. And they did Clear some, they did clear a lot, of, a lot of these things up. For example, the federal government said, hey, you can't send a freight car to a yard that doesn't exist. And no, you can't use a freight car as kind of a storage unit once it gets to the freight. They have freight, freight cars, low, 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 because being storage units, you have a huge shortage of freight cars. So again, what the government did is by eliminating the laws that prevented monopoly, the government created its own huge monopoly to run the railroads. Now, one last thing. They kept the people, the managers and owners, in charge running their own railroads because they knew how to do it best. It was just that the government had this umbrella thing to eliminate uh, all the um, laws that prevent monopoly. And Kathy, I'd like to add something on to this. One, I found out, doing my research, I realized something that is not Brett out of all today. When the United States Army got to France, we, the United States Army, completely rebuilt the French railroads. We installed signals for them, we installed telephones, we installed telegraphs for them, we showed them how to dispatch trains efficiently, we left locomotives and freight cars in France. And the United States, when World War I operated the Trans Siberian Railroad, we gave Russia 1,000 locomotives and 50,000 freight cars and left them there. The United States operated the Trans Siberian Railroad. Little known fact. In fact, we operated the Chinese Eastern Railroad. And we operated the Murmansk Petrograd Railroad for the Russians and the army to the Colombo Railroad for the Russians. All done by United States military people and civilians volunteered to maintain the locomotives from the Gulf of the Company. An incredible achievement. And I'm very proud to be able to tell that story. Gauge 
was four foot eight and three quarters. <laughs> uh, four, no, four, four foot eight and three eighths. Sorry, four foot eight and three eighths of an inch. And our cars could run on their rails well until they got to a switch. Okay? So when they got to a switch with the United States, what our railroad people did was realign those switches so that our cars could get through. And by the way, we built over 1,000 miles of new track for French railroads during that time. A good question is not now, but four for eight and three eighths. And of course, as I was saying, so, so people ask me, well, why are you French in three eighths? I said, well, they're French. <laughs> Okay, one more, one more question or comment. One more question or comment? Yes, sir. Do you think if the uh, government had kept control of the actual rail lines after the first war, that we would have a different, you know, like we have federal highways, we have federal railroads, and we let the railroad companies operate there? You're going to get a check, too. <laughs> I'm losing a lot of money here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good question. The question had to do with uh, would it be much different if the Government had taken over the railroads you know, after World War I, I'm assuming. Okay, believe it or not, there, were, there, there was a movement, particularly by the railroad unions, for the United States to nationalize the railroad system, literally take it all over, because that was happening in Canada at that very time. Okay? So you see it happening in Canada, so why can't we do it here? There was another thing, too, that in legislation, and this was never followed through, the Interstate Commerce Commission was directed to create a non-monopoly railroad system in the United States. We gave them 10 years to do it. There were several plans floated. None of them were ever put into effect, okay? The reason why the railroads were not nationalized was because President Wilson, or Bo Wilson at the time, when this happened at the end of the war, because Wilson was preoccupied with the Versailles Treaty. But Wilson was, was very, very reluctant to take that extra step for full nationalization. He let it go. However, it was due to a senator from Iowa by the name of Albert Cummins that came up with a plan that not to nationalize the railroads, but to regulate them more directly. That the Interstate Commerce Commission would set not just maximum rates, but minimum rates. And he came upon the idea that a railroad could make a profit up to 6%. After that 6% profit, everything went into the United States Treasury. In doing so, railroad systems were permitted so that connections could be made more smoothly. You know, if you're traveling across the country, the connections could be made more smoothly. There's a loop, but they could not, but these railroads could not create a monopoly into themselves. Okay. So it's a good question, but it really was up to President Woodrow Wilson at the time, and Wilson was very, very reluctant to make that to make that step. It was a personal thing by Wilson. I had the hunch that it had to do because his son-in-law, McAdoo, was in charge of the railroads during World War One when, when you had that government takeover of them. And I think it had something to do with this. McAdoo wanted to run for president in 1920. Now, McCann was Wilson's son-in-law, and he, he was the Democrat Party. Wilson made sure that his son-in-law would not run for president. And I think there was something in there, and I haven't dug deep enough to find out what it was. McCann later became a senator from California later on. Uh, he was married to Wilson's, to Wilson's daughter. Sorry, uh, I think that we're going to time the last question. Uh, just want to mention the articles on the have the sign the book for you. It is a tax deduction because you cannot be good for the book. It is a donation to the historical society. So you've been a great group. Not only that, you drown me out and singing, and that's wonderful. <laughs> you did really great. Okay. All aboard. All aboard the Corn King. We do Sioux City. We do Sioux City to Point East in our western station in Chicago. We do Sioux City. Track one. Track one. Station stops. And station at Ottawa. Ottawa. Missouri Valley, Missouri Valley, Denison, Denison, Carroll, Carroll, Ames, Ames, Cedar Rapids, Clinton, Northwestern Station, Chicago. All aboard? All aboard.